Hello and welcome to Factory Berlin. My name is Graham, I'm from the Factory Berlin team and I have the pleasure of welcoming you into our community for the evening for tonight's masterclass, Overcoming Imposter Syndrome with Dr. Lisa Orbe Austin. Before we get to the headline event, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Factory Berlin is and what we do here and how we help our members. Um, so Factory Berlin is a community of over 4,000 members. Um, they come from across disciplines. So we've got a lot of people working in tech and business, but also a lot of artists and creatives. Um, and as well as just individuals working here in our community, we also have a lot of teams. So that's startups and corporates who also come together to collaborate, to make new projects, to explore new business opportunities and have an impact on our surroundings and our world. There's a few ways that we support our members. Um, so we have programming, which includes events like tonight, uh, as well as fireside chats. Uh, check out our website because there's plenty of events coming up. There's always lots happening in this hybrid virtual event world that we're in. Um, and as well as the events, we also have um, very specific programs. So we have Stealth Mode, which is our um, female and non-binary founders project uh, program, sorry. Um, and there's actually about 24 hours left of that program application phase. So if you're a female or non-binary founder, uh, please do check it out. Go to factoryberlin.com forward slash stealth dash mode. Um, yeah, read a bit about what the program is and also apply if, if you fit the bill there. Um, and we also have an artist in residence program, which brings creators and artists into our ecosystem for a three to six month period. Um, and we also uh, enrich our ecosystem by partnering with lots of really cool organizations. So Google for Startups and Entrepreneur First. And together, all of these programs and activations really uh, support the ecosystem and support our members. Normally, if this was an in-person event, which hopefully we'll get back to uh, soon, um, we would do a little intro networking portion. Of course, because we're virtual tonight, we can't do that. Um, so instead, just drop a little comment in the chat, letting us know what your name is, where you're from, and we can get to know each other that way. Um, another little housekeeping note is um, if you've got any questions during the masterclass, please do feel free to add them in the chat and we'll collect them. And at the very end, there'll be a 15 minute Q&A portion. So please keep the questions coming through. On to the headline act now. So uh, tonight we're joined for our masterclass by Dr. Lisa Orbe Austin, who is a, a, a psychologist, an executive uh, coach and a transformational consultant. Um, her work is at a featured in many amazing media outlets, for example, Forbes, NBC, The New York Times. And last year, she released um, a book on overcoming imposter syndrome. Check it out. It's called Own Your Greatness. Um, without further ado, I will hand the mic over to the highlight of our night, Dr. Lisa Orbe Austin. Hi. Hi, Graham. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you to ha for having me. This and Factory Berlin, Charlotte. I really am happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to having this class with all of you and and interacting in the end. So I'll get right to it. Um, so you know, imposter syndrome has been really popularized in a notion in the last couple of years, and you know what the data has shown is about 70% of us experience imposter syndrome over the course of our careers. Um, it's important to recognize that because I think it's it's more common than people think, and oftentimes it's super common to struggle with it alone. And I think it's really important to know that there are many of us who are struggling with this experience. A recent KPMG study found that 75% of female executives across industries have experienced imposter syndrome. So that number is even higher than we have talked about for many, many years about imposter syndrome and its impact on people's career lives. So what is imposter syndrome? So imposter syndrome was a term that was coined about a, a little over 40 years ago. And it was first discovered by two two psychologists, two female psychologists um, who were working um, in a college counseling center um, in Georgia and the United States. And um, we're noticing as they were working with administrators and graduate students that they saw this really strange experience where really qualified, capable, you know, amazing credentialed people were acting as if they were um, constantly going to be discovered as a fraud, that, that they feared being revealed as incompetent, that this was sort of plaguing their experiences. And they didn't really understand it. It had never really been talked about before. So they began to do some investigations about it and began to explore sort of what was this phenomenon. 
And so doctors, doctors Clance and Imes who discover this, they, they very much use the term imposter phenomenon. They don't like calling it imposter syndrome because it becomes, they think a clinical term and be, becomes something that people think is pathological. But this is not a diagnosis, it's not a mental health condition, it's a phenomenon that occurs. Um, it's become popularized as imposter syndrome, but they are very anti that term, but we use it because that's how people identify it. Um, and what they recognized was that it happens in people who are high achieving, and that one of the things that they see is that people tend to deny their success, their credential, their, their ability, and instead attribute it to luck, mistake, you know, their ability to overwork and overfunction, or as a result of a relationship. Um, when you have imposter syndrome, it's often really common to not like compliments, to, to discount you know, anybody who praises you um, and feel a lot of fear and guilt about your success. And, and sometimes success can be a very triggering experience. Even instead of being a happy, wonderful experience when you're successful, it can actually be scary and make you feel like, you know, now you have to prove yourself. Now you have to, you know, go to the next level and that now you're going to be found out. Um, there's often a correlate too with, with this experience of not feeling truly intelligent or not feeling su super smart or capable, um, and also uh, a very common connection to perfectionism, um, where everything has to be perfect with no mistakes, no humanity in some ways to it. Uh, otherwise, you can't internalize the experience. If there's any mistake that you made in a presentation or a project, it's not good enough. And so perfectionism can really strongly underlie imposter syndrome. And also we see this other experience of overestimating others while underestimating ourselves, looking at somebody else who sometimes may not even be a fair comparison point and looking at them and feeling like, wow, they do this, that, and the other thing. I'm so not even close to what they're capable of doing. So I think it's really important to recognize all these different components of imposter syndrome and really see that you know, these, these features you know, that underlie it sort of create these conditions that make you feel like you don't deserve or can't really take accountability um, for the things that you've done that have been successful. There are like four hallmarks of imposter syndrome. Diligence and hard work, intellectual inauthenticity, charm and perceptiveness, and seeking mentorship for external validation. The diligence and hard work is this experience where people feel like the way that they approach a project with a with a sense of like diligence, meticulousness, perfection, and overwork is central to how they identify themselves professionally. It becomes so so much very centralized in their identity as as who they are as professionals. Um, this experience of intellectual inauthenticity is about um, finding moments in which you downplay your intelligence, downplay what you know, downplay your expertise in order to make other people in the room comfortable, um, make them not feel threatened, make them feel like it's okay for, for you to be there. Another piece of it is the charm and perceptiveness that often goes in connection to um, this experience of intellectual and inauthenticity around that most of your relationships really, really form around you being in some ways kind of, and I think, you know, I often use this word because I think people experience this, but it's not true, that they feel like they're being manipulative. They're, they know what people want and they know how to meet that need. They know how to show up for the people, other people's needs and that's how they get what they want. But actually what's shown in the data is that people who have imposter syndrome usually have high emotional intelligence. And so they mistake that high emotional intelligence or that EQ for being charming or manipulative or perceptive. And, and that's how they get what they, what they need to succeed in life um, or what they succeed in their professional lives. And then the final one is the seeking mentorship for external validation. It's this experience that, you know, Mentorship serves many, many purposes. It can serve as, you know, clearly some piece of external validation, but it can also serve to gather information about, you know, the professional world that you live in. It can serve to help you make other connections. It can serve to help sponsor you sometimes to help you get further in particular opportunities, but it doesn't serve just solely the opportunity for external validation. And when you have imposter syndrome, you tend to seek mentorship solely for this experience of someone who you respect and you value telling you you're doing the right thing, your work is excellent, but solely for this particular purpose. And that particular um, hallmark can sometimes lead people to, uh, who have imposter syndrome to actually choosing mentors 
who, whether consciously or unconsciously, understand why they're seeking the, the mentorship for this external validation. And as a result, can sometimes, if they're unhealthy, use this, this particular knowledge to, um, to, to manipulate them into overworking for them and, and doing things for them. This can sometimes show up in bosses who you know, understand that you're constantly looking for approval and they use that approval to continue to get you to prove yourself to them um, and withhold the approval. So there's a lot of dangers in some of these hallmarks that we often work on to help you overcome because that's really critical not to get caught in any of these um, dynamics of imposter syndrome. So there's, there's what we call the imposter cycle. So when the imposter syndrome is not triggered all the time, you're not experiencing imposter syndrome usually like 24 hours a day. Usually it's triggered by something. It's usually triggered by a, you know, high perform, like a high visibility event or a project. It's, it's triggered by a new experience. It's triggered by something where you feel like you have a, a lot of responsibilities that, you know, feel, you know, very, very potentially influential or you know important and so as a result of these moments you then have a you then get freaked out about performance and can have performance anxiety that performance anxiety then leads to overworking to cover up this fearing this fearing of being exposed as a fraud then you get a performance review about the particular project or moment you typically because you're a high performer get approval but because you're not very good at taking in positive feedback, you then let it go and move on to the next thing. One of the things that I think people often say to me who have imposter syndrome is like, I feel like I get caught in these cycles of trying to just you know, take it up a notch and do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. I can never get off of it. I never ever feel like it's enough. And I think that's very much a part of what it's like to be on the imposter cycle. I like to be on that wheel of never feeling like anything you ever accomplish is good enough and it can be very hard to get off of it. There's also what we call the imposter cycle too. It begins in the same way, triggered by some event or project or performance. Um, you then, as a result of the performance anxiety, either procrastinate or self-sabotage and procrastination is self-sabotage. Um, and I think also too, what we talk about with the way that this procrastination and self-sabotage looks different for people with imposter syndrome is that you can often get caught in these short burst cycles of overwork. So while somebody in cycle one is overworking the entire time, they've been assigned the project to the actual you know, moment that the project lifts off. Um, when you have imposter cycle two, you, you will push you know, something to the, to the very like last minute and then get into a massive cycle of overwork. You'll work 18, 20 hours, you know, work really intensely for short bursts of time, which can be just as exhausting as working over a long period of time. Then in this cycle, you'll get a performance review. You'll either get approval that it went well, despite the sabotage or the procrastination, or you'll get mixed reviews that something, you know, went wrong or there's some something you have to pay attention to or you get some, some constructive feedback. Typically when you have imposter syndrome, anything negative or anything constructive gets blown up. It becomes like the only thing that you focus on um, around the review, the, the approval, the positive, you just let it go. But the negative becomes the thing that you highlight. Um, and that brings you into another, the next cycle, you know, as a result of not internalizing anything positive that happened in the performance. So, you know, oftentimes people ask me, like, where does imposter syndrome come from? A lot of people, you know, uh, say, oh, it's social media that drives imposter syndrome. Or I've heard lately there was a Harvard Business Review article that came out two, two weeks ago that said, oh, it's oppression that creates imposter syndrome. Well, none of that has actually been shown to actually create imposter syndrome. I think it definitely triggers it. And sometimes it like things like oppression can make recovering from imposter syndrome that much harder, but it's not the typically the origins of imposter syndrome and what got you here. Um, if it were social media, it would have existed. It wouldn't have existed till social media became a thing, but clearly it's been happening we know probably been happening far before before the 70s, but we know it was discovered in the 70s, so there wasn't a lot of social media back then, so it definitely isn't that. And then the argument around oppression is easily debunked by the fact that many people from privileged groups also feel imposter syndrome. So if it was solely oppression that did it, um, then only people from oppressed groups would feel it. And so there's a lot of, you know, I think stuff coming out. But what we see is that there are childhood dynamics and experiences 
Um, and I'm just going to talk about a few of them. In my book, I talk about a lot more of them that have been discussed um, as a part of this early experience that leads to imposter syndrome. But there are three common roles that people take up in their childhood that are very common for people with imposter syndrome. So the first one is that they were considered the intelligent one. They were considered the smart one of their siblings or, or their peers. Um, and as a result, this meant to them and maybe to the family that you didn't have to work hard, that if you were intelligent, things came easy. And so anytime you felt like you struggled or you had a hard time or had to work a little harder on something, it was proof that you weren't as intelligent as people thought you were. And the second childhood role that's typical is that you were the one who worked hard. So you weren't considered the one who was naturally gifted or naturally talented or, or the things came easy to. You were the one who had to grind, had to work hard, had to really put in a ton of effort to get anything out of it. And as a result of that, you never really thought about any natural strengths you had or any gifts or talents that you had. It was really everything came from working hard, extremely hard, like overworking. And then the final one, these, the first two that we talk about are, are in the literature. They're, in the, they're discussed in the research literature and the scholarship. But the, when Richard and I were, my partner and I were putting together the book, um, we were discussing this and we were like, there's a third type because there are people in our practice that we see that don't fit either one of these. And we categorize the third type, which is that, you know, it's the type we consider the survival type where they, you know, this particular person had very little adult support or a, a very little caregiver support, and their main focus around achievement was survival. So for them, achievement was really about being able to be free from their current circumstances or being able to, to be able to determine what happened to their future with a little bit more um, agency and a little bit more sense of like that they could control that. And so oftentimes when we see people in this third category, they can have like a C-suite executive role, multiple of them, and they're always fearing one mistake and it'll all go away. And everyone will discover I'm a fraud. And there's a real like fear, fear that their survival will, will discontinue if they, they don't sort of overwork and engage in these behaviors. Um, um, there are also other family dynamics and I encourage you to check the book out to, to learn about other family dynamics, but these are some of the common roles that are, 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 we see pretty often. Now, um, in terms of the impact of imposter syndrome on different groups, now, while imposter syndrome has been decently researched over the last 40 years, I wouldn't say that there is a plentiful body of research on it, like there would be for anxiety or depression um, or other you know, conditions, because it is not a mental health issue. It doesn't receive the funding, like in the United States, at least from, you know, um, the National Institute of Health or the National Institute of Mental Health. And so as a result, a lot of people don't study it because they require the funding um, to support their research. So I would say that the research on different impacts to different groups is very limited. And I think there needs to be more research done on LGBTQ populations, on, on gender non-binary experiences. They're just and on different racial groups. And so this is what is out there currently about different groups experience of imposter syndrome. So um, for women, this is cisgendered women who identify in this way, don't, it doesn't prevent them from achieving, but they do as a result um, fear, have a constant fear of their fraudulence. So for women, they find that um, they're very um, commonly, uh, counterphobic. And so counterphobic means that they will face the fear. Um, so they'll go toward the thing that they fear the most. However, um, as a result, they're constantly fearing, um, fearing this experience of being um, labeled as a fraud or being found as incompetent. The research finds that, you know, females spend more time on task than those without imposter syndrome, so they'll spend more time on things and they work harder when they receive negative feedback. So work harder in terms of time or effort on a particular project when they receive negative feedback. For men or males, you know, cisgender males, again, tend to affiliate with peers um, with less advanced skills. So because of some of the cultural norms around masculinity, there's a lot of stuff around sort of covering and fear of being less than. So oftentimes men who have imposter syndrome or high scores and imposter syndrome find themselves um, not necessarily putting themselves in places where they feel a lot of risk for their imposter syndrome and also um, find themselves underachieving in a lot of ways. Um, and so they're less likely also to pursue certain careers. Like there's a, there's some significant research to suggest in STEM, men will, if they, ha they have imposter syndrome, will be like less likely to pursue science, technology, engineering, and math 
kinds of related feels. Um, and so for people of color and women and first gen, um, what we sort of find is that there's a double impact of imposter syndrome. And it's so this experience of both experiencing the imposter syndrome internally and really, um, you know, trying to fight it and trying to recognize your accomplishments. But then also too, you're also receiving cues from the external world where they're telling you, well, you might, you might be an imposter. You might be a fraud. You might be here only because of the color of your skin or because of this, op this opportunity or that opportunity, not because you actually deserve it. So as we're, as we're working on our imposter syndrome, the external world can reinforce the imposter syndrome, you know, through discriminatory behaviors and, and whether implicit or explicit and make it very even harder to recover from or, or to get over. Um, so one of the things that the research points out is that for people of color, women, first gen, any, any group that is feeling like their identity is targeted by the outside world dominant groups as being less competent in some way or less intelligent or less capable, that it's really important to find other peers and mentors um, who share that identity component, component with you so that when the outside world is discriminating against you, it teaches you how to not, not necessarily take it in, how to kind of like, how to develop strategic partnerships that help you come out of it, how to, how to really find ways to, to cope and be in a healthy kind of um, uh, experience around ourselves with, when the external world is constantly pounding on us that we don't belong or we don't deserve to be here. So community is so critically exposed important, especially when you experience the double impact. It's important for everyone with imposter syndrome, but especially with the double impact. So what are some of the impacts of imposter syndrome on leadership? So how can imposter syndrome impact leadership? It can impact it by creating micromanaging behaviors because when you have imposter syndrome, one of your concerns can be that your direct reports or people who report to you um, can do something wrong and that would reflect negatively on you. And so as a result of that fear, um, it, can, it can affect the way that you manage others by getting too involved in their work product because you're very worried it's going to be a reflection on you. Um, it can also um, affect the way that you deal with mistakes. And, you know, either you have difficulty making your own mistakes or tolerating mistake making in other people. Um, and not seeing it as a growth opportunity for them to learn, for you to learn, that mistakes are human and natural and a part of success. Um, it can also leave you feeling undeserving that if you win an accolade or promotion or you get an opportunity, you can often feel undeserving of that opportunity. And many times when we have we get an accolade or some kind of moment, it's important to leverage it professionally for us. And people with imposter syndrome will just get the accolade and hide it. Um, you know, I remember somebody. You know, we we took a, a cohort through through the book, and I remember somebody in the cohort receiving an amazing honor of being like the top forty under forty in their profession, and they weren't going to tell anybody. Um, they were embarrassed and they felt like they shouldn't share this with anyone because it would make other people feel bad and they didn't deserve it anyway. And so it's moments like that that I think really, that imposter syndrome can really affect what you do with the moment in which you are being celebrated. Um, it can also affect um, how, you, how you talk about your involvement within a group or a team or your contribution. Um, oftentimes minimizing your involvement, minimizing the value that you add um, and it can also affect um, your assessment of where you fall on the team. <clears throat> so sometimes you're asked, you know, outright, like, where do you think you fall on this team? You know, are you, you know, top 10, top 20 percent? You know, are you bottom? And oftentimes people with imposter syndrome will actually deflate their assessment because they really don't feel like they deserve it. They will, they will never top rank themselves. Um, so this really can affect, you know, th times where you have to, where you're, where we call it force ranked, where you're forced to rank things or you're forced to kind of, you know, talk about sort of how you fall on a team. So how does it also affect your career development? Um, so how does it affect how you progress in your career? Um, you know, like we just, like I just talked about, it can, it can affect the way that you understand your value, the way that you communicate that value to other people when you're interviewing for new roles or you're getting funding for something or you're, you're going out and talking about something that you're working on. It can really affect the value that you see that you contribute to that. It can also affect your, 
in your negotiation skills because sometimes you're just happy to get the offer or happy to get the funding and you don't negotiate anything um, because you're just afraid to lose it. Um, you also can feel a re reluctance to buy for promotion and feel like, oh, when people feel like I deserve the promotion, then they'll give it to me, as opposed to do some of the necessary work that it sometimes requires to get promoted, including the politicking, including sort of like the visibility pieces. Um, it also can affect your desire to take on high visibility stretch assignments, assignments where you know it's a little bit outside of your comfort zone or sometimes a lot of bit outside of your comfort zone. And you can tend to want to avoid those things because there is a greater tendency or a greater possibility of ha making a mistake or it not being perfect because it's not it's outside of your comfort zone, outside of your, your skill set of mastery. Um, it can also affect your your desire to network, um, your desire to talk to other people about what you do and how you do it. Um, it can definitely affect how you talk about accomplishments to others. And it can also affect um, how you envision your long-term career future. And really, oftentimes people with imposter syndrome have trouble envisioning their long-term career career because they often are relying on other people to, to approve what they're doing and say, yes, you're doing a good job, this is the next step. But in some cases, you know, they're not telling you that and then figuring that out on your own can be very difficult about what you're going to do with your career in the future because it really is about your own interests and your own desires and, and that can be very hard outside of somebody else's external validation. So I, I, I wanted to add this because I've been talking a lot um, to journalists and other people about um, imposter syndrome and how the pandemic has affected it. And I have seen a great you know, rise in people talking about imposter syndrome and sharing that they've been struggling with it, especially during the pandemic. And I think there's a lot of reasons why um, that I think make a ton of sense. But it, you know, these are some of the ones that I have seen most commonly. I think people are struggling to adjust to new methods of working and living. It has changed the way they operate in their work lives and that has been very disconcerting. Um, especially because, you know, sometimes in our careers, you know, putting in FaceTime, building the relationships, doing all of that stuff um, is much harder now that we only typically meet with people on Zoom if we have business to address as opposed to just being like, oh, yeah, I just like to, you know, we, we meet each other at the water cooler. I just like to talk about, you know, yesterday and what happened yesterday in the news or whatever. Um, it's harder to do those kinds of things. And I think it's made people feel very uncertain about their stability of their jobs. Um, also the economic conditions make people feel very concerned. And I think job stability and the stability of your career can really affect um, your imposter syndrome and make you feel even more desirous to overwork and not be proved as incompetent or not valuable. Um, there's a lot of pressure to overwork, um, especially when balancing your personal and professional life. So there's, there's not a lot of separation and boundaries in traditional ways. Like we don't go home from work anymore or, or very few of us do. And so it, walking away from work isn't as easy. Cutting, closing the laptop, shutting off our phones, um, really kind of disconnecting can be really hard. And as a result, that overworking tendency can be further exacerbated in these moments. And I think, you know, on top of that, there's a lot of overload on us um, in terms of like just the stress of dealing with the pandemic, many of us taking care of family in different ways, parents, all these other things. And these, you know, additional demands, even emotional demands can affect our concentration and efficiency. And so, and that can be very scary when you don't feel yourself working at the same ways and rates you were once working. It brings about that threat of, um, you know, being found out and not doing enough or not contributing enough value, which can be very triggering to the imposter syndrome. And then this recent report came out from BCG showing that women were carrying about 15 additional hours uh, of childcare and family responsibilities than, than, their, than men um, and in all kinds of different ways. And so in, in the US, we have seen a massive impact um, on women in the workforce and you know in i think we lost about 170,000 jobs um about 2 months ago they were all women and so it it has been a specifically a, a a very difficult time for you know women in this workforce and that this has been very scary to a lot of women who are facing this and worrying about 
um, the impact of this on their career lives and having to stop out or do different things because of the amount of demand on their lives is just is too hard to is too difficult to manage and juggle it all. So those are some of the things that I think have been triggered by the pandemic. So in terms of, in our book, we talk about, um, so I talked about sort of what it is and what it causes, and this is sort of like how you solve it. And so this is the, you know, image from our book um, that talks about the phases in which you have to go through to kind of solve it and the tools that you need. And so when we were developing our book, one of the things that was very important to Richard and I was that um, we develop we look at the research and show what has actually been shown to, to move the needle on the imposter syndrome. What tools do you need? What interventions do you need to move it? And then because like I said earlier, it hasn't been as well researched as we would like to see, um, there are gaps. And so when we were thinking about, you know, how, what, what do you need to go through to actually be able to turn the dial down on your imposter syndrome, we had to fill some of those gaps with the interventions that we have seen in our practice that have been incredibly effective um, in, in changing the experience of imposter syndrome. And so in our book, we talk about these three phases, clarify, and in that phase, you're really trying to understand what are, what are the origins of your imposter syndrome? Everyone's imposter syndrome looks a little different. And so as a result of it looking a little different, knowing sort of the the origin of your own and understanding it helps you to understand how it shows up and why it shows up in the way that it shows up in 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 your current life and that helps you to know the triggers and trapdoors and that allows you then to make other changes in the second phase we talk about really building the skills and tools um, that you need to to be able to conquer this and i'll talk about that a little bit more in a second um, but it's really about choosing new ways of behaving when you're triggering, triggered for the imposter syndrome, as opposed to the old ways, like the overworking, the self-sabotage, um, the looking to others for external validation, like moving away from those and moving to new skills to cope with the triggers. And then in the final, it's, it's about creating the optimal environment around you and within you to make sure that you are actually in some ways buffered against you know, the, the triggers for imposter syndrome. So really learning to kind of try on new roles and build a team around you and then understand what you need to be in your best um, place to, to make sure that you can combat your imposter syndrome. So what, what alters imposter syndrome? So what changes the dynamic with imposter syndrome? The first is understanding where it came from, really understanding your particular dynamics in your family, your, your early experiences in childhood and sort of where, it, where did it get started? And then as a result of knowing where it gets started, really understanding what your triggers are today and really being able to um, identify them so that that you don't become reactive to the trigger. So like I showed you the cycle before about imposter syndrome, knowing your trigger allows you to potentially disconnect uh, any part of that cycle because by identifying the trigger, you can then prep for the trigger or you can notice yourself falling into the performance anxiety and the desire to overwork and then make other decisions. And so identifying the triggers, knowing what they are, knowing their origin path um, so that you can see sort of the connection to today and what's happening for you really helps you to begin the process of disrupting the cycle. And then I think also another piece of it is learning to learning what the original, the origin narrative is like, how are you talking to yourself about your strengths, about your skills, about your accomplishments, about your credentials and watching how the imposter syndrome lays over that narrative and learning to change and what we call, what the narrative therapy calls thicken the narrative, really help it you not to have a thin narrative about your skills and accomplishments, but a very thick, robust narrative about your, your skills, your accomplishments, your credentials, um, that isn't tainted with imposter syndrome ideas and ideas of fraudulence and incompetence. Um, and then, you know, moving to this idea of owning and celebrating your skills, your accomplishments, your experiences, really learning. It's, it's almost like learning it from the first time, for the first time, because oftentimes we are incredibly bad at being able to appreciate um, who we are, what we do, how we contribute. And oftentimes 
the when we are actually faced with this with with our accomplishments we're actually embarrassed we're trying to remove ourselves from situations like that but really developing new healthy habits around owning and celebrating our skills and being able to talk about them and share them in 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 ways that are are different from the way that we used to think about them also then followed by combating our automatic negative thoughts so when you are triggered you know in that in that in that green phase above Oftentimes we have a set of thoughts that follow that trigger. Oh, this is going to go badly. Oh, I've never done this before. Oh my God, I, I need, you know, I'm, I've never done this alone or all these negative thoughts that, that tell us that things are going to potentially go wrong, which then ignite the desire to either overwork or self-sabotage. Learning how to combat your automatic negative thoughts or ants as we call them really helps you to take control of that narrative um, and, and pieces of that, those, that thinking that push you to kind of believe that the only way to do the only way to do things and succeed is with this particular philosophy. And I think, you know, in this particular phase, it's about identifying the ant, really beginning to realize, oh my gosh, that isn't, I do have that thought on my negative thought. What is it, learning to categorize it and to there's different categories of automatic negative thoughts and being able to label the category because it helps you to externalize the thought. Um, <clears throat> there's a very famous saying by Amit Ray that where he says, you are not your thoughts, you are the observer of your thoughts. And it's such a critical piece of imposter syndrome, beginning to recognize and observe the thoughts that are occurring almost automatically, and then making them not as automatic, and then learning to kind of create these counter narratives of rational responses based on the real, the real truth about who you are and what's happening in this moment. <clears throat> this particular skill takes, takes a fair amount of practice, but with practice can become a new automatic way of responding to very difficult thoughts that have often prevented you from being successful in the past um, with dealing with imposter syndrome. And then um, the next piece is valuing and instituting self-care practices. When we have imposter syndrome, we're typically very bad at caring for ourselves. Typically, you know, we are at the bottom of the rung when it comes to all of our time and our effort. We typically get the leftovers. Um, so whatever's left in our day, then maybe we get a little bit of something to, where we take care of ourselves. Um, this is something that needs to change when you want to alter your imposter syndrome. You really need to learn to, to put yourself first in a lot of ways, which can be very, very frightening and troubling to us. One of the most common things I hear about imposter syndrome is people saying, well, if I work on my imposter syndrome and I do these things like put myself first and, and celebrate my accomplishments, will I become a narcissist? We don't have we don't have the early childhood experiences or when I say you know emotional DNA to, to become narcissists. It's not it's not in who we are when we struggle with imposter syndrome. We fear it terribly. We fear that doing any of these things will make us into a narcissist, but it's just not the case. Taking care of yourself is really about making sure your tank is full and making sure that you are prioritizing your needs and your well-being as you work to take care of other things and other people. But it, it's really about having good scheduled processes and understanding the tanks that you need to fill around your self-care um, and having good practice, consistent practices that fill your tank, which, you know, when you have imposter syndrome, burnout is your like, is your like friend, you know, burnout, like nobody's business. Um, and it's so familiar to you, you know, that almost you don't even know how, what it looks like to come out of it. And developing these self-care practices are really helping you to realize burnout is not normal. It is not healthy. It is not good for a, a good and long and healthy career life, um, that we need to kind of stay away from it as much as possible. And then we move to this idea of experimenting with new roles. And so when you have imposter syndrome, you often get caught in these very rigid roles. Like for example, being a super person, like, you know, somebody needs some things and then it's you to the rescue. Um, no matter what's happening in your life, no matter what other things you have to do, you're always running to people's rescue. Um, another common role is like the helper. So if people need a volunteer, you're always the first to volunteer. Um, not ever evaluating or whether you have the time or the effort, or you, even if you want to volunteer, but you always feel like you need to volunteer. We can often get caught up in these ideas of being the knowledge hub and wanting to have the answers to everything. 
Um, but with working on your imposter syndrome means giving up some of these roles. It doesn't mean you'll never do them again. It just means you're going to do them with a greater variation and you're going to be a person who can ask for help and receive it. You're going to be the kind of person who learns to set boundaries and say no. Um, you're going to be the person who really sometimes doesn't know something and can admit that. Um, really practicing and experimenting with these roles. And we talk about it in the book first in very low stakes ways, in ways with safe groups and safe environments, and then taking greater and greater risks to do it in places where you fear doing it, like in the workplace or with your boss or other places. And then the final piece is so, is so important and we leave it to the end because it is sometimes often very difficult to do, but in building community. And in the book, we talk about the kind of community that you need, the specific types of roles of people that you kind of need in your community. We call it the dream team. And it, it, it includes mentors, you know, someone who will serve as a mentor for you, maybe multiple mentors in a healthy way. And we talk about in the book what a healthy mentor means. Um, also somebody, you know, who is a cheerleader who can really know how to like, like celebrate you and celebrate your wins, which we tend to freak out about and not really enjoy. Um, somebody who really helps ground us when we make a mistake and we feel like it's the end of the world, like somebody who's really good at grounding us, somebody who's good at really beginning to see the landscape, the larger big picture of things when, when we get caught in the very present moment. So really having a very diverse community of people. We also talk about the imposter expert, having somebody in your life who understands what imposter syndrome is and you can talk to them about what you struggle with pretty, at, pretty honestly and openly um, so that it doesn't become a secret anymore. It doesn't become something you don't have an open community to, to discuss. Um, so it's all of these pieces that are really critical um, to dealing with imposter syndrome. And we actually tested the book out in the fall with a, with a small, with a pretty decent sized cohort. Um, and we saw them, so there's a scale called the imposter phenomenon scale that you can actually Google and, and take, which shows your level of imposter syndrome. And we had them take it in the beginning and the end of the course of, the, of going through the book. And they were able to reduce their imposter syndrome scores by 30% in a matter of uh, 14 weeks by going through the book. They went through the entire book. So it is possible to reduce this and reduce it quickly um, if, you, if you just build the skills that you need to kind of alter it and commit to practicing them because these are skills that are going to come with you for the rest of your life and you've got to commit to practicing them and knowing that they have to be a part of your life. Um, but it can change and something that's been with you for 30, 40, 50 years can be something that you really dial, the, the dial down on and can change pretty quickly. So if you want to learn more, you can come check me out on Instagram. I, I write about this stuff and, you know, do reels and lives and all that stuff on, on Instagram about imposter syndrome. Also I'm on Twitter, I'm probably not as active on Twitter as I am on Instagram. And also on LinkedIn as a, as a LinkedIn top voice. Um, and then that's the name of my um, TEDx talk, the imposter syndrome paradox. If you want to take a look at that, it, the, my TED talk talks about my own personal experience with, with imposter syndrome and one of the darkest moments it led me to and how it shifted for me. So, so I'm awesome. going to stop sharing. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was really brilliant. There's a, a round of applause. Thank you for sharing <laughs> those welcome. insights. Um, yeah, so we've got some questions that have come in through through your talk. So um, I'm going to go through those and, and hope you can share some insights. Sure. Um, the, the first question was, have you yourself struggled with imposter syndrome in the past? Yes. I mean, that's what the TED Talk was about. I, you know, I actually experienced it pretty profoundly in my life. And I think, you know, one of the things that I think is hallmark about my story is that i um, Oftentimes when people have imposter syndrome, they think, oh, when I get the next promotion, when I get the next degree, when I get the next credential, it's going to go away. And mine was at its height um, after I finished my PhD and after I graduated from an Ivy League university. And um, it really just really affected my career choices. And in the, in the, in the um, TED Talk, I talk about how I had a really horrible boss. Um, and that horrible boss um, helped me to see how my imposter syndrome was really um, making me feel very poorly about myself and allowing me to choose certain environments that weren't healthy for me and, and how it all ended. But yes, I've been through it very profoundly. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks for sharing that story. I think it, the, the, what's very good about 
so what you're sharing is it's, it's very we can all kind of relate maybe to that and if we can't then i think it's also important for us to to, to be more empathetic on these things um one another question that came in which perhaps relates to your story as well is um how can an employer ensure a healthy environment that doesn't nurture this um you mentioned it there's different schools of thought on whether it's a cause or a, a trigger but how can how can an employer ensure that it's not a trigger yeah, I mean, I think it's really like the culture of the environment and that it doesn't, we talk about imposter syndrome triggering cultures. And so, for example, one of the hallmarks of an imposter syndrome triggering culture is where there are stars and scapegoats, where there are people who are doing amazing and then there are people who, who you know, everyone's scapegoating and acting, acting like they're the problem. So really kind of getting away from these very dichotomous kind of like notions of people, um, really being much more focused on a growth mindset around mistakes and people making mistakes. I think really training managers on, on really dealing with sort of, you know, their responsibilities in different ways. I think we don't do a lot of management training in ways that we should to help ensure people don't engage. And I always say this about management, but, um, and the workplace is that people bring their family dynamics to their roles and their leadership. And I think we don't do enough to deal with that. You know, so if you grow up in a very authoritarian household, that's how you learned how leadership happened. And so you get very authoritarian because that's all you know. But I think really teaching people of different leadership styles, learning their strengths, really helping and watching for this stuff and talking about it very openly, imposter syndrome and who has it, it's okay, and admitting to this and having leaders admit to it. I think it frees up the conversation. Um, and, and if you find yourself as an employee in that situation, someone has mentioned here um, that they, they themselves uh, are this kind of, in, they are this uh, aggregator in, of imposter syndrome, this, this culture in a company. How do you as an employee uh, rise above that? Um, how do you, do you handle that if, if your leadership of your organization isn't able to? Um, community. So never do it alone. Um, it's really important because that's how you end up part, getting scapegoated. Um, mm -hmm. You really have to find community. You have to find other people who kind of can see that and want to create different pockets of other kind of culture and really like doing nurturing that kind of culture within these pockets. If you want to stay at that organization, um, really helping to nurture healthier ways of being and engaging with each other. So creating safe spaces in essence. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, someone here has has, uh, has said that they they maybe struggle with uh, with supporting someone with it, dealing with their imposter syndrome because they are they have it themselves. So, uh, what recommendation or what advice do you have for people that are in that kind of situation? I mean, I think it's it's great that you that this person has recognized that they struggle with it themselves. I mean, I think that's like the first step is recognizing. And I think sometimes I've heard many people say that their their manager has said you know, I have imposter syndrome too. And I see something similar in you. I haven't totally figured it out myself, but I would strongly encourage you to, you know, and I think, you know, uh, take a look at my book. My book's super concrete and super like skill-based. And so it gives you the opportunity to kind of offer a resource, like check out this book or check out this, you know, talk or whatever. I think people have found it incredibly helpful when managers have done it with kindness and done it with open heartedness and wanted to really, you know, be supportive, you know. And not feeling like you're alone as well. Yeah, yep. Um, someone's written here, is gaslighting a potential trigger, a trap? And how do you suggest and that you cope or react when you are being gaslighted? It's a great question, because I do think it is a specific trigger, especially for oppressed groups, um, when you are experiencing gaslighting around an identity component, you know, so I think it can be very triggering. And I think one of the things that's really important is that you don't get gaslighted, you're gonna hear sort of a thematic component, don't get gaslighted alone, is that you share the gaslighting experience with somebody else and be like, look, I, I said I was experiencing this, that my boss said, no, you're not, or that's not, that's not what happened. And then they can help you sort of piece together sort of like, in, and maybe it's a couple people, right? But thinking about sort of how do I respond to this in my particular situation? How do I also cope with the internal experience of being gaslighted? Because it can feel really lonely to have that experience and very scary. And so really kind of finding ways to process it for your own experience and then figuring out how to strategically deal with it in the workplace. Because, you know, the, it can require... Um, a strategic lens around how to manage it because uh, a boss oftentimes who's gaslighting you is not ready necessarily ready to take ownership for that gaslighting mm -hmm. so you have to think about how to handle that okay 
Thank you. Um, you, of course, are an expert on the topic and you're talking to a lot of people about it. Um, uh, someone's asked here, do you think that as a society we are moving closer to understanding um, and, and kind of having a, a better way of dealing with it socially and in groups um, with this imposter syndrome? I think, I mean, that's the piece that I feel most excited about is that people feel more open to admit that they struggle with imposter syndrome and be, and talk about it and have real kind of ideas and, and solutions around how to handle it. I think that we're only recently talking about the interventions that change imposter syndrome. We just used to talk about you have it or you don't have it. And so I think it's really important that we do talk about it actively. I remember when I started my doctoral program, you know, I was a doctoral, a doctoral student in psychology. They clearly knew about the concept of imposter syndrome. It was like 20 years old at that point. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to my mentor after meeting with my cohort for the first time, they were so accomplished, so smart. And I said, I don't think I belong here. I think it might have been an accident. And my mentor turned to me and said, well, I guess we're going to find out, aren't we? And, you know, like it, 20 years ago, it was okay to say that to somebody with imposter syndrome. Today, I think, you know, hopefully we'd handle it differently and be like, let's talk more about that. And let's try, try to understand why you feel like that. Cause you belong here. Mm -hmm. Like that's the proper response. Not like, well, I guess we'll find out. Cause that's actually just reinforcing the imposter syndrome. So it's exciting to me that we will, we will have language and we'll start talking about this more openly. And all these people are sharing that they have it. It's, it's really exciting. Yeah, and thank you for, for sharing your experience and your expertise on that as well. Um, someone asked here, where on earth to start? Are there some small in incremental steps that we can take? So tomorrow, like daily little things that we can start Im implementing in our day-to-day -day lives that can help on these things. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if I thought about sort of like the first step, like what, what is the first thing you should do? I think the first thing is really just admitting that you're struggling with imposter syndrome and being able to be compassionate to yourself in that admission and being like, okay, I've got, I'm struggling with this and I've been struggling with this for a while and admitting it, maybe even telling one person about it, telling someone you trust. I think that can be a really opening moment. Um, and then trying to do something about it. So, committing to one piece of this, right? Committing to either deciding, figuring out what your origins are or figuring out sort of like how you're gonna combat your automatic negative thoughts, just doing one piece of it. Um, you know, in the book, it's, it's you know, people like get excited about the book and the book's not a big book. I'll, I don't have it right near me, but it's not a big book. So everyone's like, oh, I'm going to read this in a weekend and solve my imposter syndrome. It's work. Like changing your imposter syndrome is work. There's, I'm not going to kid around about that. It's, it's work. Um, but it's work that's worth it because it really changes your um, the way that you interact with your work life, with your identity, with the ways that people will or won't treat you. And so I think it's a really important thing to commit to and is, is overcomable, you know. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, just to everyone out there, thank you so much for your questions. And yeah, we'll, we'll all be um, Googling, finding your, your book now to, to read it and get to work on all those things. So thank you so much um, for sharing. Um, yeah, to everyone, if you've uh, found some really interesting insights, do share them on social media. And um, you've already got uh, Lisa's handle, so go follow us and follow uh, Factory Berlin as well. Thank you so much for joining us, Lisa. Thanks so much for your masterclass. You're so welcome. And good night, everyone.